Acts chapter 16. From verses 16 onwards, probably to the end of the chapter. So we, we're looking at this second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul and the circumstance and the situation that he finds himself with the rest of the guys. Pretty amazing of what God does to those who have totally given themselves to him. So before we read, let us ask God for his blessing over these words. God, we thank you again for the privilege to be here, the privilege to be found in you, the privilege to publicly read your word, Lord. We ask that your spirit will be at work in us as we read it, and I pray, O oh God, that the power of your word would cause our hearts to change and to do that which you have called us to do. I pray that you cause our minds to understand the truth of your word as we read it today in Jesus' name. Amen. We concluded with a short story of a lady called Lydia who heard the gospel. It, she was a pretty wealthy lady as we saw, and the Bible says that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And she and her household received the gospel and they were baptized. And then, you know, they asked or they begged for these men of God to remain with them for a time just for encouragement and exhortation. And verse 16 says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned aside to the Spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrate and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrate tore their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And, they, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in these talks. You know, in our text today, I would, you know, I have three suggestions for, for the title. You choose one that will fit you at the end of our teaching today. The first one is, Praising God in the storms. The second one is what must I do to be saved? And the third one, 
is standing now for righteousness. You will choose what suits you at the end of our study today. But we see, you know, on, on the way, the Bible tells us it happened as we went to pray. We don't know if it's the same place where uh, we, we mentioned last week or we read last week. They would go by the river to pray and seek the Lord and share God's word with people. I don't know if it's the same place. But you know, you know in our way to prayer or to the service of the kingdom, to the service of our Lord, we will or we might encounter things and circumstances or people who would seem to be doing well or things that would seem right to us. But we must be discerning to know what things or what spirit we're dealing with here. The Bible says that it happened when they went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her master much profit for what? Fortune telling. This was a big business for this gentleman. And considering that the wealth that this guy had acquired, you know, he would do anything to protect this young girl so that he would continue to get a lot of money. You know, normally people want things to be done a certain way or just, you know, we, you, you want to give a prayer and you want things to be done right there. You know, this microwave generation, I want it just right now, just right now. I don't got time to wait on God. And people had known this man, people had known this girl, and her fortune telling. So perhaps he had a lot of customers who would flock into his house to come and just to have a glimpse of what would happen to your life tomorrow. You know, we are so obsessed with knowing about tomorrow, we are forgetting to live for God today. We have an opportunity to serve God today, but we, I just want to know about tomorrow. What can I do tomorrow and tomorrow, tomorrow? You know, even Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples and they asked, you know, how to pray and all that, uh, all those things he said in the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You know what Jesus meant? that we ought to trust him for each day. Trust him today and let tomorrow be. You don't know about tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow holds. We only know who holds tomorrow. So I'd rather trust in him who holds tomorrow that if I have an opportunity to see the light of the day, then I know I am safe with him than just trying to get everything, to amass things, I want this, I want this, I want my tomorrow to be better. Apparently, that is one of the reasons why we even send our children to school. Why? Because I want my tomorrow to be better. <laughs> that is why I'm looking for the job, right? Because I want my tomorrow to be better. That is why I want to buy a little shamba in town and buy some properties so that tomorrow, me and struggle, uh-uh. <laughs> I want tomorrow to be better. Maybe there was a lot of people coming. They just want to know about tomorrow. Can you tell me something about my husband? <laughs> my wife, will, will he be here tomorrow? <laughs> Because he, he's, he's a tricky guy. Now I see him, now I don't. Can I know something about it? No, no, no. W would you trust God for things? We just want to see things today and today and today. When you encounter things, even when you're going into the house of God, I pray that you be discerning to know the kind of spirit that you meet on the road. 
This girl, the Bible tells us that she followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. If you just take that one verse, she said what was right in it. Were they not the servants of the Most High God? Were they not proclaiming the way of salvation to people? I mean, how do you, you can you debate that? <laughs> They're proclaiming salvation to humanity. They're calling on people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we do every week. But here's the catch. Not everyone that says you proclaim the good news actually means it. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is actually following the Lord. Jesus said it. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will see the kingdom except those who do the will of my Father. You know, Luke has a way of pointing these things out. You know, in Luke chapter 4, verse 33 to 34, and also Luke chapter 8, verse 27 to 28, he mentioned different circumstances where demons would recognize Jesus. What do we have to do with you, you son of the Most High God? They recognize who Jesus was. The demons will recognize Jesus, but they don't worship him as Lord. Not every person who will say to you on the street, Buanas if you were, really means it. Buanas if you were. Some of them don't mean it. Some of them mean it. But because it's a the so-called classic Christian greeting, we just say it. We don't mean it, but we say it. Notice that the God's word were very true, but Paul did not want the people to link the spirit of divination to the work of the Holy Spirit. That is why he got tired after many days. You know, if he wasn't walking in the spirit, Paul, he would have said, well, at least the, she's helping us. People will know that we're the servants of the most high God. Is that sinful? <laughs> People will know what we do. But this continued for many, many days, and Paul said, uh-uh, we got to bring this to an end. <laughs> this is too much. She got to shut up. And we know it's not the girl. There's a demon inside. <laughs> There's a demon. The, the demon says these people are the servants of the Most High God. That is weird, right? What about people who are dressed in suits? And they stand on the pulpit and they say things. <laughs> Would you be sensitive to know if they are of God or they're just repeating things they've learned? You know, public speaking, anybody can learn. <laughs> you can learn public speaking and get a few principles here and there and be a motivational speaker and all of a sudden people think you're the mightiest preacher who has ever been. Paul didn't want people to confuse these things. So what she did, he did, cast out the demon in her. And that's the end of it. <laughs> and also Paul was, I suppose he was angry that the girl suffered, but her master never cared about her. He only cared about the money he was making through her. 
I mean, she, he was not mindful about the girl, the life she led, her well-being. It's just like we, we've lost a lot of money right now. It's like I want to find another one. <laughs> this is gone. The, the, the millions of dollars of shillings are all gone. What am I going to do? Friends, you do not want a demon preaching the gospel to you. You don't. And you guys would think, well, you know, this demon will, will have black clothes and horns and blood in his mouth. Leave those things over there. We are lied to today from the pulpit. Jesus would start from here. <laughs> to cleanse his house, he would start from the pulpit. Because Jesus said what? They would cross land and sea to make one proselyte twice the son of hell that they already are. And Jesus, Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else. He warned us more than anybody else. Why would we think that we would get along with people and we're not getting along with Jesus Christ? He says this, we do the exact opposite. He says to us that in the last days, people would come with itchy, itchy words. And because our ears are itchy for those kind of words, we set ourselves aside to listen to them. Because they're dressed nicely, you know, with the suits and ties, expensive apparel, and you're like, yeah, that is the man, that is the man. We, we can be deceived. Even the prophet of God, Samuel, was deceived by the looks, you remember? So surely this is the anointed. But that was not true. <laughs> we can be deceived. And I want to mention this. I know probably it will, it will hurt some of you. But oh well. We're going to continue studying God's word. I know many of you were watching Remo Fest, right? I know from your faces, a lot of you. Did they teach the Bible? Or they will pick one verse and take it out of context for their own good, for their own purposes. Because they want to make themselves great, you know. You know, the, the, the apostles and the prophets and who of you. They, they, they don't want to be called pastors because that is little. It's, pastors is for us, the little people. And if you share with people the truth, they say, ah, oh, you are brainwashed. And I want to tell you, I want my brain washed with the word of God. I want it clean with the word of God. I don't want to be lied to. You know, the reason why these things is many times painful for me because I got born again in there. I would sit with notebooks after notebooks after notebooks, sitting on the television, listening to these televangelists, to hell evangelists. My life was destroyed and I didn't know it until God had to make an unfavorable situation for me to be kicked out of that church, for me to go and find truth. And sometimes when we mention like, oh, just let those people alone. You know, my job here is to feed and to warn. They don't come to us simple. <laughs> we don't like to be warned every time, right? But we've got to be careful the people we listen to. We've got to be careful whatever we... That was 2000... No, 19... 99, when I got born again, and the things I heard those years, I have to intentionally fight them today. I have to. 
So you can't tell me that I'm just going to listen to them to just to distinguish. <laughs> no, you listen to them because you like them. You like them. I don't want a demon preaching to me. These demons were saying things that are very right. These are the servants of the Most High God. They are preaching salvation. You're like, thanks for helping. None of these other people care about us. Thanks for saying a word. No, 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 no. You got to be sensitive. <laughs> you got to be discerning to know the truth. And we have said it before, if you don't know the false teachers, 99% chances are you're listening to them. You're listening to them. You're taking their notes. You know the reason why it's hard to run away from what they say? Because they're very clever. They're learned people. And the half-truth that you receive is more dangerous than none. More dangerous. Be careful, church. Who do you want to listen to? This guy's master was very angry at Paul's actions of rebuking the demon to go. But you know what? The girl was now free. It's only that the master is losing money. So which one is important here? For people to be free in Christ or to have a lot of money with no Christ? What profiteth a man to gain everything in this world and to lose your soul? This God's honor dragged Paul and Silas to the marketplace. This was not only where people sold things. You know, in a Roman colony, it was a center of public life. Every important thing was done before everyone to see. Everything that mattered to them, they'll bring it before the market, before people to see. Like, look, this, this man has offended the law. So if you're be, to be taken to prison, everyone in the marketplace will know <laughs> that you have offended the law and you're taken in. Think about the shame that comes with that. You are accused wrongly. Everything they have said is not right. But there you are in the marketplace. And they are stripping off your clothes. You're receiving lashes in public. I mean, what would you have done in that circumstance? In other words... Their lives are on public, shameful for standing on for Christ, for doing what is right. So my question to you is, what would you do in that moment? For I suppose, maybe not you, but people out there, you know what they'll say? God, I've served you for years. Is this how you're going to pay me? I have done this for you. I've just been fired. I have served you, Lord. My family is going without food. I have served you for years. You have blessed my friends, but not me. We have a big list of the things we can complain about. While other people will tell us that when you get born again, then you will never suffer. You will never go through hard times. You will never be sick. You will never lack. I 
I would want to find those people who told me those things those years <laughs> and have a conversation. Why? Because I still trust in God today, but I've been sick a lot. I've gone without food. I've walked without shoes. I want to ask them questions. I've lost people. I want to ask them questions. Do you think God is not mindful of our situation? Do you think we ought to worship God only in good times? Think about this man. All they do is to serve the Lord. Now there's public shame. They're about to be taken to prison. What would you do? Would accuse God for leaving us. The God you have. You have left me. You have done this. Paul and Silas were wrongly accused, painfully beaten, and their feet fastened on a log. Preston, you have the image for us to see how these people, these Romans were very clever people on how they would treat their prisoners. If you escape, we know that that was God. <laughs> But on a, on a regular basis, you don't escape from this Roman people. They knew how to torture people. Look at where their legs are. And this is not even to the extreme because what they do also is they chain your hands. So you can't even move. You can't go nowhere. This piece of wood is drilled to the wall. You can't move with it. It's there permanently. What are you going to do in this situation? You've just been beaten outside the marketplace. Everybody knows about it. There's more pain in the inner chamber of the prison. That is where your pain will continue. I mean, did, did Silas Mention to Paul and say, hey, I think Jesus said you, you would suffer, not me. <laughs> I think he said you, he called you, he said, I will show you what you must suffer. But there they are, suffering. Do you think they are suffering because they did wrong to God, that they didn't worship God in spirit and in truth? Don't get it twisted that even people who were born again, we go through situations. But how we come out of them is what will determine if our faith is on Jesus Christ or it was just wishy-wishy. Paul and Silas were not ashamed of their God even in the middle of pain. Even in the middle of pain, they were not ashamed. They are in prison. Verses 25. But at the midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chain were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled. So he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are still here. We're still here. Don't kill yourself. You know the punishment that 
this man would receive for letting loose a prisoner or a prisoner escaping. The same punishment that was given to that prisoner would be given to you. This is what they did. So this man thought, either way, I'm a dead man, so I want to make it easy for them. When they come, I'll be gone. <laughs> I want to kill myself. But Paul was still there. The chains are off. The piece of log is broken. And we're free. But they did not run away. You know the, 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 how the Holy Spirit works. In, he works in different ways. When he took uh, Peter out of prison, what happened? He's like, we are out of here. <laughs> See you later. You know, those guards, they were not aware of what was happening. Until when the angel went to the next street and said, ha, ah, now you know your way, go. <laughs> this is different. The chains are loose and they're still in there. Like, what was their thought process? What were they thinking about here in the prison? They were not ashamed. First, the Bible says they prayed and sang loudly. This, I love this point. They prayed and sang loudly that other prisoners heard their songs of praises, but not the groanings of pain. The other prisoners in the next chambers, what they heard was what this man praising God. This man singing. This man praying to the living God, not complaining. That's amazing. That's amazing to me. That you'd be able to do that in the middle of all this trouble. I mean, what, what kind of strength is that? I want to have it. I want to have that kind of strength. To serve God in the middle of my troubles. You know, the, and this first title, you know, we would like it, you know, praising God in the middle of the storm. That God is faithful no matter what. There's an important lesson for us also to learn. That you serve the Lord not to gain favor. You serve the Lord not to gain favor, but because he has shown you favor already. He's shown you favor already. You know what it means when God's favor is upon you? It means his hand is upon you. His hand of protection is upon you. He's with you. He's Emmanuel at all times. God with you. He who watches over you never sleeps nor slumber. That is the God that we serve. So, God's people should always know that he's always looking after them. He's watching. He's watching. In a place where earthquakes were common in Philippi, this one earthquake was different. Why was it different? Because it opened the prison's door and the prisoner's chain fell off. That is the difference. They've experienced other earthquakes, but the prisoners were still the prisoners in there. Their chains didn't fall off. The prison doors were still locked. That is the difference. That when God shows up, these chains, they'll have to go down because he's the chain breaker. Amen? He's a chain breaker.
this tremor brought freedom to God's people. Other people were afraid, but this man, like this is one thing to praise God for. He's done it. He is faithful. He remains to be faithful. This officer wanted to kill himself, but Paul called him. Then he changed his mind. After Paul called him and said, hey, we're still here. And perhaps, I don't know if he had, because he was sleeping. I don't know if he had the prayers, he had the song, any testimony of this man. But you see, what happened there, after Paul called to him, he ran and fell before them, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out of that chamber and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This would be my favorite title for this. What must I do to be saved? I need a savior. What I just saw here, I have never experienced before. No man has ever told a story like this. And this is not just a myth. I have experienced this firsthand. What must I do to be saved? That is a very important question for anyone to ask. What must I do to be saved? Because clearly, I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. I don't know what my leaders will tell me when I let you go, but oh well, I'm going to do this because I know the God that you serve is the one I want. Now, if they will take me in because I believe in him, perhaps, yes, perhaps he will take me Perhaps he'll break the chains again the way he broke yours. I want this God. I want this Savior. Then the, the word of God was preached to them and the officer and his household. They believed and they received salvation that night. That was a special night for this jailer and his household. And the Bible tells us also that they were all baptized. And the joy that comes after people have received Christ and they are baptized, the way we saw this lady, Lydia, she got born again, her and her household, they were baptized. And then they say to Paul and, uh, and Silas, can you guys stay longer? We want to keep on hearing this. We want to be encouraged. Sirs, what must I do? So they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced having believed in God and all his household. This is my favorite. They rejoiced for believing in God. They rejoice that God, Emmanuel, is present with them. What a joy to know that my life is hidden in Christ. That I am with the king. That the king came down, sought for me, found me, and now I am with him. What a joy. This man was happy. He cleansed them. And think about Silas and Paul. 
They are still in pain, I suppose. There's just some spirit on their back. They're like, yeah, don't do that. That's painful. Even in the middle of that pain, they say, we are going to dump all these people in the water. <laughs> we are going to continue serving the Lord no matter what. Friends, let not the painful things we go through and encounter in this life deter you from serving the Lord. They come and go. If they should stay, I would ask God for strength to bear them also. He says, my grace is sufficient for when you are weak, then you receive strength from who? Him. What a joy. He washed them, and they washed him. <laughs> he washed them, and they washed him. The washing that he received was more important. The wounds in his soul were deeper than the wounds in their skin. He needed a savior. Deep-rooted things in his heart and the sin and all that stuff. That cannot be compared with the lashes that are out here when our confidence is in Jesus Christ. It cannot be compared. So he received something even better. Paul and Silas never compromised for anything because their confidence was in God. But you see, what we see nowadays in the so-called the believers is that they are setting the Bible aside in the attempt to be like Jesus. How would you ignore what the Bible says and you want to be like Jesus? So let, let's handle this situation the best way we know how. Just let the Bible here, we'll come back to it. Setting the Bible aside to know Jesus? That's creepy. How will you know him without his word being revealed to you? And that is the generation that we are living in. Setting the Bible aside in an attempt to be like Jesus. The same twisted generation says that they are sacrificing truth for love. What truth is this? That is in setting them free. And what love is this that has not the maker's touch in it? We can just repeat words that we hear from people and we think, yeah, they're, they're good, this is good. No, 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 no. Like, let's come, let's join together and do this. No, 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 no. We are not going to do things together with the people we don't agree with biblically. At least the very fundamental things of the Bible. We can't. Though they will say they are Christians, but we can't. We will not. Friends, we live in a fallen world. And I will say it again. Be careful, the people you listen to. Be careful. Be careful. There's greater revival when you think about the mystery in the salvation story. You know, when a child is conceived in the womb, there's a special connection they have with their fathers still in the womb. You know they can hear the voice of their father in the womb? You guys know that. They can have feelings right there inside the womb. Feelings of joy, 
sadness in the womb. They can hear the voice. But it takes a real birth for this connection to be actualized. When the ch a child is brought to the earth and they hear the voice of the father, they put it together. Yeah, I've been listening to you, Pops, for a long time. Nine months I've known you. You think they don't know? They know. In other words, it takes a rebirth to be connected to our Heavenly Father. We live in a sinful world, but still we can hear the voice of the Father calling. But it takes you to say, I want Jesus for that connection to come back. People who are detached from the Father. Say, sirs, what must I do? What must I do? So you must believe. In this world, God has been calling on to people. He still does even today, calling on people. Every day, every day, as I bring the worship team to come. But have you asked yourself this question? What must I do? What must I do? You can hear the voice. You can hear his voice in this sinful world. But you must call unto him for you to be saved calling unto the Father. You know, I don't know what's your motivation to serving the Lord. I don't know what's your motivation to worshiping the Lord. I have a few here that I thought about. You will have your own list. But my list, number one, my motivation for worshiping God is my need for a Savior. I need a savior. I need him in my life daily. Number two, my motivation, that he calls to me and he stands at the door. Revelation 3.20 says, behold, I stand at the door. Now you think about him. What is he doing at the door? It's calling, always calling. Always calling. Number three, because his presence is with me. You remember those three Hebrew men who say to the king, we will not bow down and worship your graven image. Let it be known to you today. Whether we perish in the fire, let it be known today that we'll not worship your God. And he got angry and threw them in the fire and, you know, they, it was seven times more worse. And you know what the Bible says? That when they were thrown in there and they are standing in the middle of the fire and they're not being consumed, a fourth man appeared. And the description is like the son of God. He didn't know about Jesus. He didn't know about anything about the son of God. But he said what? He's like the son of God. That was true. It was the son of God in the middle of our trials and our fiery dirt that the enemy would throw to us. You know that Jesus is always present in these situations. 
Other people might not see him. But even in your pain, in your tears, he's right there. He sees you. He knows you. He's mindful about you. He's a good God. My other motivation for worshiping God is that my identity is in him. My identity is hidden in Christ and that I am known by him. And lastly, as it it's recorded in Deuteronomy 6, 5, that you must worship the Lord God with your heart, with your soul, with your strength. Everything about you should love the Lord. That is my motivation for worshiping God. What is your motivation? Let us bow our heads and pray. God, we thank you again for the privilege the privilege to hear your word, the privilege to be called your sons and daughters, the privilege to be saved, the privilege to be born again. And I pray if be there anyone amongst us who is asking this question, what must I do? The good news is here today, is to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is Lord, and you'll be born again. Anyone who wants to turn to the Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to them. You draw them to you. You say in your word that when you're lifted, you draw men to you. We pray that you will draw us to you this morning. We thank you. We know that you're coming soon. Behold, he comes. Riding on the clouds. Our king is returning. Before that, I pray that we'll be found worthy of this calling. We'll be found ready, serving him and doing his will. I pray that we will have the joy of the Lord with us as we serve. In the painful seasons, in our trials, that we will not complain and grumble, but will give praises and glory to our King. As we give our finances to our King, our Lord, our Savior, I pray that we'll give a portion that is glorifying to Him. In Jesus' name we pray.